So I am currently recording this for YouTube. Everyone cool with that? I consent. Excellent. You consent. Okay. <laughs> I always got to check these things before. So uh, in fact, hello and welcome to the video for those of you watching on YouTube. In fact, I have today with me some of the best, I think, comedians in the magic industry out there. There's, there's so many, there's loads of comedians in magic, but I, I guess it, I'm so honored to have Joan Lenahan and Paul Reagan to do this with me. Uh, most of you know Paul, he's a regular on the channel, but I think you've never met John before. So uh, this is for YouTube audience. I mean, obviously they know you, but they've never seen you on the channel before. So in case there is someone who doesn't know you, John, please tell them about yourself and tell them what you do. I'm on YouTube. <laughs> you are on you, yeah, are. you are, yeah. If you, if you Google, uh, nuclear cooling towers. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely tell us tell us some stories about that. Uh, uh, but I think uh, yeah, I think what we'll do is at the end of this video, I'll put all your links in the description of this video, so anyone watching this can go and click on that on your Instagram or whatever that you want them to go and check out, maybe your YouTube channel or anything like that. But it's, I'll tell you what, to be honest with you, I am personally not very qualified to talk about comedy. Uh, and and I, I think Paul and you are much better. So in, in fact, I'll tell you what, let's leave this interview with Paul. And Paul, you can conduct this whole interview or chat or whatever, and then we'll just have a chat okay. about stuff like this. That's, right? that's probably a good idea. Okay, let's uh, do that then. I, I'll start because I know once John gets going, that's it. I yeah. <laughs> it's like a steamroller of anecdotes, which is good. But I think people um, want to hear stories, so it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so we'll hear the stories quickly. Um, but you, you said you wanted to talk about comedy and magic. And uh, John, I'll, I'll, I'll chuck it back to you in a second. But I think there's a big difference between kind of comedy magicians or uh, magicians who are really funny act after act after act and magicians who use comedy. There, yeah. there's, there's, there's a massive difference between the two. Like David Copperfield is not a comedy magician, but whenever you watch one of his specials, you've always got the one or two kind of comedy acts normally yeah. involving Webster or Wilbur, the, the duck, uh, which wasn't a duck. But so, so, so there's a big difference between the two. Now, I, I would certainly put myself more in the comedy magician role than a magician who uses comedy. But, but yeah, that, that's what I'm going to chuck in. But I'll, 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 John, what do you think about that? Well, no, absolutely. So... Uh... To answer your first question, like who am I? I I came over to Britain, you know, 35 years ago, and I came over as a street performer. And then I started looking around and an alternative comedy was starting then. And we're talking about, you know, place the comedy store and jongleurs and but there was like 80 comedy clubs in London. And uh and so I just, and we were like, the, you know, we were the new rock and roll. It was great. I hit a wave at just the right time. And where I was on the street, I was, a, you know, a magician that used comedy. I then went into the comedy clubs. And I'm talking about, you know, people like Paul Merton and Joe Brand and Jack D and, you know, that, all that gang. And then I became a comedian that does tricks. And now, I, you know, and I... I don't belong anywhere though. I'm a bit of a man without a country because the comedians don't don't get me wrong. They like me, they respect me, but I'm not one of theirs because I do magic. Magic, yeah. And then uh, the magicians think I goof around too much to be a proper magician. <laughs> uh, when you're in the comedy clubs, though, it's all about laughs. I mean, it, they don't care how good you're as the comedians do. That's the important thing. And you can you can spice things up. I mean, you can. You, can fool people every once in a while and, and that's all well and good but if they ain't laughing it ain't working yeah yeah I, i'm gonna um i'm gonna say you think i think john's being a bit harsh on himself there because john you are incredibly knowledgeable when it comes to magic of course yeah he is and you know you got some chops on you so that's that's not but, yeah, yeah but what, what he's saying is because if you want if he, what he's saying is, if you're in a comedy, if, if you're in a comedy club and then suddenly you pull out magic, they usually tend to look down on you as like, oh yeah, the guy is using props or whatever, right? And that's not like that's sort of frowned upon in the magic world, in the comedy world, I guess. And, and it's fair enough. And I think the real reason for it is is because so magicians, by and large, don't think a joke is anything special, so they steal them, and that's why right. comedians don't respect them because they don't care about the magic and usually the 
is is all nicked from yeah. somebody. That's and, and that's why I and people do respect me in in the comedy world. But I think John's absolutely right there. Like um, he was talking about the alternative of comedy back in the eighties, and that was really when comedians have to say yeah you want to get on the bill first so you could use all the good jokes so john was really very much part of that new culture of no your act is you you know what have you got what what have you created and he's right magicians most magicians don't really have that uh, you know that and that's why that's why i think i can come back to the idea of a magician who uses comedy and a magician who is a uh, who is a comedy and a good magician now because magic is so rare still, re relatively rare, you can get away with people thinking you're the funniest magician they've ever seen whilst using the same gags that everybody else does. Now, John and I have both done street. It is really pre prevalent in the streets to use standard lines. And that's okay. It's just, there's, there's a difference, between, I think, between like your standard lines, your, those kind of things that we all know, and building a whole act around gags that have been around since dot. Or you saw someone do that three months ago and you really liked it, so you chucked it into your act. And magicians are so bad I mean, at doing that. That was the interesting thing about the circuit. I mean, I mean, comedy in Britain is, is kind of very interesting. I mean, what, what happened with comedy in Britain is after World War II, you had this labor movement. And then the labor movement meant that there was uh, labor unions and factories all up and down the country and all of those groups had clubs for their they had working men's clubs so if you belong to that organization you got to drink in this private club and the booze was cheap and they always had entertainment you know terry rogers you remember terry rogers the ventriloquist yeah and then a great magician in her own right and she wrote a couple great magic books and my book test uh, that I've been using for 15 years was invented by her, the key. If you remember the book test, the key. She told me once that you could work four nights a week in West Yorkshire alone for an entire year and never repeat a club. But the problem with that whole working men's club circuit, and I came in on the very end of it, was that everybody nicked everybody else's jokes, right? I remember going to a comedy club once with a comedian called Barnaby and we were in the second half and I said, let's go get a drink. And he said, no, I got to watch the comedians in the first half. And he just sat there and went, okay, that joke's gone. That joke's gone. And the, the headliner was the guy who, who had the most stolen material in his head because he, <laughs> he needed that material because it would all disappear in the earlier act. Yeah. But the London comedy clubs put an end to that. We had, we had a rule. You couldn't be racist, you couldn't be sexist, and you had to write your own jokes. Wow. And so I know, I know a big time comedian who's, who's kind of from that Northern area, it was our age, and I, I won't say his name, uh, but he's big and you, you would know who he is, but he never did the London circuit. And then one day he kind of said to all of us, I can do the comedy store. What's the big deal? You know, this alternative comedy, I can do that. And he went down, he did a 10 minute open spot at the comedy store, he tore the room apart. And the manager of the comedy store came up to him and said, you're welcome back anytime as soon as you get your own act. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. That's absolutely it. And I, I think magicians are still there. As magicians were still quite happily just ripping each other off. And that is a, yeah. a big issue. Uh, it's, no, it's, and that, you're not only each other, comedians as well, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, any, anything. It's, it, which, is, which I thought was quite weird, because I would have thought magic would, um, it, it's very kind of imaginative and wonderful, and it's magical, you know, the idea of magic, poof, I can make anything appear. I would have always, I always would imagine the kind of person who does magic is the kind of person who would want to have a unique voice as well. But that isn't the case. Now, I'm not, also, I'm not necessarily, I don't think I'm frowning on it either. Uh, it's not what I do, but if you're, if you're going out there and you're buying your, you know, you buy your six tricks and you do them as written and you chuck in lines between that you've heard or know work, I don't, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but 
I, I wouldn't view that kind of act no, in the same yeah. way that I'd view, uh, you know. There's nothing wrong with bad comedy. I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with bad comedy. There's nothing wrong with, with bad singing either, you know. I mean, uh, it's, it's just that, and the cream floats to the top as well. That's the other thing, too. Mm. But uh, I mean, I remember going on a cruise ship once and there was another magician, they had booked three magicians. But right off the bat, he said, okay, what jokes do you tell? And I said, mom. <laughs> <laughs> ah. I, I do, I, I, I'll fess up, I oh, think there's, okay. a, there's a couple of lines that I use oh, that well, are kind of standard lines. But you know, I, I, that's okay. And especially, I, 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 and John, I think you, you, you might agree, when you're doing street, it's really hard not to get into using the lines that you know work because well, especially, yeah. especially the bottling speech yeah exactly oh, yeah. The, you know that's just that when, well, when no. that's your living you, you you're not getting paid to go on stage you're going on stage to get paid but you do the safest thing you, don't you know can what the bottling speech is the bottling speech is the speech at the end yeah you get people to speech or, yeah but interestingly enough a lot of those bottling speeches lines come from actually come from a guy Oh. And they come from a guy named Phil Herbert, uh, but his his street, his street name was Randolph the Remarkable. Yeah, just he was the guy. He was the guy who invented the, the "Please take out your donations and fold them up" line. Oh, I see. That was him. So and many also, of them used that today. The guy who used to say, as people were walking away after the show, he, he would shout, "Remember, guilt is a terrible thing." <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it's fine, honestly, if you think of getting industry or you're interested, then do that because mm. you, they, there's a reason that they, they work. You know, yeah. it, 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 when you're doing street, I, I, I see it very different to doing a stage act. A stage yeah. act, you get, you're gonna get polished that street, you're there and it's flipping, you get paid now or you're gonna go hungry tonight. Use, oh, yeah. use what works. But again, with, with doing street, it's how I got good and I'm sure, it's how, well, hopefully good and John same with you you do oh, so you do so many acts doing streets uh, that you just very quickly can perform uh, John do you think about comedy clubs you know I look at uh, you know in the, in the old in when jonglers got big the way you would get into jonglers is you would do a, a five minute open spot and then if that went okay you'd get another one and then you'd get like maybe five of them. And then you would get a 10 minute slot and you'd get like 20 of them. And then finally you would get a shot at a slot, which is 20 minutes. And it would take some people, you know, a year and a half, two years to do it, right? I called up Jean Glares after winning the Time Out Street Magician of the Year award. And I said, do you do open spots? And, and Maria, who ran Jongler, said, can you do 20 minutes? And I said, yeah. And she said, come in. And I went in that night and I, I headlined and compared there for 20 years. You know? So, I mean, it, it was kind of a different, you know, day. In, in, well, that's in, it. I was going to say, because Jonglers know. I mean, now, trying to get... I, 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 personally, and John, tell me if you think I'm wrong here. The stand-up comedy it was all the open mic spots that suddenly all the pubs and all the clubs were doing. Suddenly, I think everybody, the comedy was almost demystified and everyone thought they could do it and suddenly you're not getting paid to do it. Um, it's oh, no, so the, hard now to, to break it. You no, know, the comedy yeah. circuit's really strange. You know, my, my, you've met my niece Claire. I don't know if you've met my niece Claire. I, I know Claire, yeah. She's... Actually, Brenda, could you put right. Claire's link below as well? Because Claire's great. Okay, oh, Claire is great. Yeah. People should yeah. check Claire out. So, Claire, Claire is um, Claire's losing her mind at the moment. She's uh, <laughs> she's, she's filming uh, the shut-in Olympics, and she's playing all the parts. Oh, wow! <laughs> Actually, John, can we can we not talk about people losing their mind? Look at Brendan's beard. Okay, it's a bit. We don't want to be going down that route. Okay, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you, don't know. you know what? I came this close to shaving my head. No oh, way. I was well, thinking of doing that. We'll, we'll do it. Well, I was never actually thinking of doing that. I've never done it, but yeah. I've always wanted to, 
to just do it once. And, and this is the best time, right? <laughs> I've always had gigs. Yeah, you that's know. the problem. That's the problem. I always have gigs, and if I shave it, yeah. That's it. So, so Brendan, your next video is the three of us just shaving our heads, yeah? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> but with, with all of this comedy, I think, you know, with magic, sometimes if there's a room that there's just no reactions, you can just do the trick and you'll still get that wow factor. With comedy, if the, if the crowd is just not into it, what do you do then? You just walk away? Or you <laughs> just... I, John, I've got, I'm going to jump in because I've got to tell a story Chris Wood tells yeah. about you. Oh, so, okay. Uh, Chris Wood's another magician we all know. Yes. I mean, I like both you know, gig with him at times. But he tells a story about... Uh, I'm not going to say what theatre, because the theatre we've both played, uh, going out in the audience, and they were just oh. quiet, and, he, and, and John just won them over, won them over. But he, 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 he just picked them, picked them, and he kept going. There was one guy who wasn't, was having none of it, and John just kept going and kept going until he got him. And that's what, I, I, John talk now, but that is... Before he says anything, whatever he says is true. John will do that, and it's unbelievable to watch so John do that. So is he trying to get the guy to laugh? Is that what the thing was? Now John can answer, and he'll tell you all about okay. it. Oh, yeah, tell us the story. I mean, my, my most famous story about, about an audience that has no reaction is, uh, is when I did Paul McCartney's Christmas party. Okay? <laughs> so I, I, this is years ago. I did Paul McCartney's Christmas party. Linda did the Katie. And um, it was in, a, in his barn in somewhere in Kent somewhere. And I showed up and it was a, it was my last gig before Christmas and it was a bad gig, right? I mean, there was like, it was one of those gigs where, you know, people were having fun without me, right? <laughs> and, and what I needed was a, a good introduction, you know, to settle the audience down and, the stage was in a bad place. It was just, it just had all the recipe for being a bad gig. And it was my last gig before Christmas too. You know that, that thing, when you have a bad gig, you don't get over it until your next gig. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I was gonna die on my ass and then I was gonna spend all of Christmas just sitting in a corner with a bottle of port going, I died in front of a beetle. And so, um, so anyway, what I needed was Paul to get on the stage and say, thanks everybody for coming and here's my special guest. But that wasn't gonna happen. And the guy who was gonna introduce me was the guy who was organizing the event and he was like an accountant. Hmm. And he, he turned to me and he said, I'm really nervous about this, like before he introduced me. And I'm saying to him, don't do it then. <laughs> like, get somebody else there. The place was filled with show business people. So I said, don't do it. And, and this accountant's going, no, I got to do it. So he, he gets up onto this stage and he starts doing housekeeping. He's going like, okay, there's going to be buses at 1115 and, and nobody is paying a blind bit of notice. There's just tons of noise in the room. And uh, anyway, he introduces me and I get on stage. And as soon as I step foot on stage, this entire room, we're talking like 300 people. This entire room just goes pin drop quiet, like just instantly quiet. And they're all going, they're all looking at me. And it's kind of weird, but that's okay. So I tell my first joke and I get nothing. nothing. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean, sometimes you get polite Twitter, right? But this, I mean nothing, okay? Right. Now here, here's a comedy tip for all of you out there. If this happens to you, what happens is, is that every cell in your body then tells you <laughs> to speed up, right? Right. But the real thing to do is to slow down. Right. Okay? So my training kicked in. I took a nice deep breath, waited to beat. And I told my second joke. And, and my second joke, I got one laugh in the front row. <laughs> and I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna do this gig one row at a time. <laughs> <laughs> well, another joke, another laugh, and the audience loosened up. And yeah. finally, at the in the trade, I broke them. Right. I broke them, I had this great gig. I mean, I stormed yeah. it. 
So it was all over. Ben Elton came up to me. Ben Elton used to host Saturday Night Live. Okay. Okay. And I'd done Saturday Night Live a couple times. And, and I'd worked with Ben before as well. And Ben's a lovely guy. Ben comes over and he says, John, that, that was great. You know, that, he says, oh, that was great. You, you, you took it nice and slow. And, and he, he says, but when you got up there, I thought better you than man. I said, thanks, Ben. And I said, I was really surprised how quickly the audience settled down. And he said, oh, so you don't know what happened. And I said, no. And he said, well, I was sitting with Paul. And I said, yeah, I saw that. And he said, we were kind of minding our own business. This guy was talking about buses. And then we all thought he said, and now for some magic, here's John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's, there's my experience with dying, almost dying on my ass. But I actually pulled it up. Nice. Oh, I guess people want to listen to stories, you know, so it's, it's really good. Uh, no, seriously, I, I wish I had filmed or recorded the bit that you, me, and Elton were on the train back from Blackpool. I think it was like three hours or whatever, and it just went like this, listen to John's stories. Yeah. Like going, out, going out for a meal with John. It's, actually, I think this is kind of um, the issue with uh, comedians, uh, people who think they can do stand-up and also maybe people using comedy in, in their routines, whether it's magic or whatever, is there's a difference between someone who can get a laugh with a group of mates and somebody who can make three hours turn into 20 minutes. Yeah. There's a big yeah. difference. Um, yeah. And you, John, you, when you tell stories and when I've seen you do routines, this isn't a side I see. It's like you, you have like a raconteur kind of style. It reminds me of the old school the, the Michael Parkinson and Terry Wogan interviews that have with like, I, I say about Chris as well, like Houstonoff or Williams or, or, or those kind of people. It's so much fun listening to you it's tell these funny, great yeah, the way, the way you tell what, stories. How about, so, yeah. how, how about you though about comedy? I mean, have you ever like completely tanked? Oh God, yes. Christ. <laughs> um, so, so before I did magic, I was doing some stand up. All right. And and yeah, the circuit. I I I just missed out on the the time when you actually got paid to start doing stand up. Yeah. Now it's like you do fifty free spots, and then after that you might get a pint if you're lucky. You know? <laughs> but um, I was getting into. It. I did a spot at this club. I'm not going to say it because they still are going. But it was basically a room full of magicians uh, of uh, comedians waiting for their turn. Oh, that's holy crap! Yeah. Not a laugh. I had one person laughing. That was the one guest who'd come along with me. And oh my the thing God. is, if I go to a gig, I'll be, woo, yeah, woo, woo. even if it's yeah. god awful, I'll still cheer and clap and scream because we've all been on stage, right? We all, yeah. I mean, but, I mean, I tell you what, I was talking to somebody the other day, you know, and I, when I was in the height of me being an, an alternative comedian, because I mean, what happened was I was at the comedy store and, and somebody came up to me and said, are you allowed to work in this country? <laughs> Which is an interesting question. Wow. And I, yeah, and I got an agent who, from up north and he got me a tour with Cannon and Ball and in a summer season with Little and Large and he got me some working men's clubs. He got me a tour with um, uh, Ronnie Corbett but then I got a gig at like Butlins in Canvey Island. And I actually oh, met to somebody the other day and they said that there wasn't a Butlins, but there was a Butlins like yes. at Canvey Island. And, and I said, well, I don't really do those kind of gigs. And they said, no, they're having a, a festival of comedy. And uh, yeah, I, I, I stared at them for a half hour without anything. I mean, they just hated <laughs> At the end, just, just hated me. But, but I'm a really, I'm really good at not dying. Like I'll, 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 I'll a coyote comedian. I will gnaw my own leg off before I die on yeah. stage. But the, I yeah. think the truly great comedians are the ones where the audience. I mean, the true geniuses are the ones that the audiences think that they either think they're the best comedian they've ever seen. Or they die horribly. And oh, Jerry Sadovich is like that. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say, Jerry Sadovich, John Oliver as well. He tells stories of him just dying. And if you see what he's doing now over in America, unbelievable yeah. stuff. Yeah, but I mean, Jerry, I mean, Jerry, Jerry Sadovich is a great example of that. 
Yeah, um, I mean, she doesn't have a middle ground. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's some great comedians that, that don't have middle ground. If, if the audience gets them, there's a guy named Andrew Bailey. Uh, and he was completely mad. I remember hiring him, having him at Monday Night Magic. And literally every other person, one person would say, that was the best thing I've ever seen. And then the next person would say, what the hell was that? Right? That was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so he, <laughs> we were doing a gig. I'll tell you what, we were doing a gig at the London Zoo, actually. It was a comedy night at the zoo. They have a little theater there. But that's- Could be by the hyenas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm comparing the show. And Andrew, as I said, he was this crazy prop comedian, but you, you, sh you really have to try this, you guys out there. So after he finishes, I come on stage and there's like props littering the stage, you know? And I'm doing, I'm just doing a routine and I'm getting a laugh in the wrong places, which means somebody's mucking around behind me, you know? And I look behind me and I see this curtain's behind me and underneath the curtain, I see his, his arm reaching and he's trying to grab his props and, and pull them back. Yeah. Because he's got another gig to do. Oh. <laughs> so I lift up the, the curtain and he's on all fours and it's kind of funny. <laughs> so I, I pretend I'm mad at him and he's a real nervous guy anyway. And I go, Andrew, you're ruining my show. And he's like, I'm sorry, John, I'm sorry. He says, look, I, I can help. I can help with your show. And I said, how? And he said, I can do special effects. And I said, uh, okay, wh what do you got? And he said, I've got rain. And I said, no, absolutely not. I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't want rain. And, and this said, is mid show. This is while people are watching you. You're chatting like this. Oh, this is it. Yeah. On stage. Okay. And he says, I've got snow. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll take snow. So I did my rope routine. You got to try this. And he got out a packet of Weetabix and he took out like two at a time and a tennis racket and he threw the Weetabix <laughs> in the air and he smashed his <laughs> Weetabix and it just pulverizes the Weetabix. <laughs> For you Americans, Weetabix, we don't quite have it in America. It's like a, it's like cereal, but it's like, it, it's in packets. It just pulverizes this Weetabix and it, and, like an entire pack behind me and it's like piling up on my head and my shoulders <laughs> so, so there you go if you ever if you ever need snow, snow in show, yeah. <laughs> that's so good need a big uh, are there any competitions you know you said you won kids entertainer of the year or not sorry it was a street perform of the year are there any competitions in mad in comedy as they are in magic or i'm not talking about like the bgt oh well, you get just, you, the, the, the obvious one which is one reason it's so big is you've got the, the, the Edinburgh Fringe okay. Awards. So, are quite, okay. The, the, the Newcomer Award at Barry Zapparia, whatever it is now. Right, right. That's so quite there's a, a competition like you'd have a normal magic competition. It's, it's yeah, I think I awards the, given. I won, the, I won the Newcomer Award in Edinburgh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah you, like 30 <laughs> years ago. Look, uh, right. no big deal. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's a big thing, though, because Edinburgh is a massive thing. John used to be a big thing. <laughs> used to he's, well so where are you performing now then at magic mondays you do at uh, camden town i do them in, in highgate okay i do monday night magic in highgate but i don't tell magicians about it magicians uh, aren't allowed to come okay it's kind of, kind of like what jerry sadovich also he doesn't want any magicians in his in his audience doesn't he well, no no i'm not as strict as jerry jerry's, oh, okay. thrown, jerry's thrown me out of a queue of his show but oh my, God. Um, my rule is that if you're a magician, you have to bring, you can't come with another magician, but you can come with three or four lay people. Okay. I yeah, like magicians have that many friends who aren't oh, magicians. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, my mom, you know, the dad, and a mop. <laughs> I say, bring someone who, who hates magic and you know who they are, you're married to them. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, because before I did Monday Night Magic, uh, Rich McDougall had a magic night in Battersea at the Battersea Arts Center. Uh, I can't remember if it was once a week or it was a late night. 
and it it got ruined because it just turned into a little magic convention. Everybody in the audience was a magician. And the idea for Monday Night Magic when I first started it wasn't so that magicians could sit there and go, ooh, that's interesting. It was for lay people to go, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, in the old days, of course, too, I had just been thrown out of the magic circle. So yeah. on the poster, it was, uh, it was five pounds in or 25 pounds for magic circle members. <laughs> never nice uh, years ago like five years ago or something i took a whole winter off and i i got a condo in utah and i skied for the for two and a half months and i was in utah and there was a tiny a little town called ogden and it had a really nice comedy club in it and uh i went to it a couple times it was a lovely little club and then I went past it one day and I saw that an old friend of mine, Jim Tabaret, I don't know if you know him, he, uh, he was going to be there. He was a headliner at this club because he's moved to America and he's doing quite well for himself. So I dropped him a line and said, hey, you're going to be in town. And he said, yeah, I'll leave you a ticket. So on Saturday, I got there early and went backstage to see him. He's an old mate, hadn't seen him in ages. And he said to me, he said, hey, we lost one of our opening acts you couldn't do like 10 15 could you and he said but there's no money but it was a lovely club and i said yeah i'd i'd love to do it i i always have an emergency act in the car by the way it's something worth doing but i said to him why is there no money <laughs> and he said because there isn't he says only the headliner gets paid and so, and I said, wait a minute, I've been here twice before. There's always been a, an MC and two opening acts. And he says, yeah, they all work for free. And everybody works these clubs for free until they get some sort of TV credit and then they, they can become a headliner. Yeah. And then the comedy circuit's kind of getting like this too. I mean, in my day, there were no headliners. And the reason why there is no headliners is because we were all doing like two and three gigs in a night. We were running all over the place. Yeah. Most these were door splits but it what it meant was is that people didn't come to the club because they knew who was on because they saw it was somebody mm. they knew. they went because the club had a reputation for having good comedy but now britain's getting to be headlinerish as well oh I I'd, say, I'd say it's there i'd say it's there john i really i i think it's there like if you try and get into comedy now uh, as a stand-up it's so hard to get, and, and even when you do start getting paid, even if you're booking like the comedy store and that, you're not getting particularly great money, even like big names. You just, now, well, the yeah. circuit never was great money. I mean, no, but, but, but there was, there was at least, but I made was, enough, quality, quantity, quantity over quality of pay, I think, if you know what I mean. I mean, I made enough money to get a mortgage and, and raise a family and, uh, but I moved to corporate, so and that's when I actually made you know money enough to pay off my mortgage. But <laughs> but the um, um, I mean that you know close up magicians usually by and large make more money than stand ups do. Really, hundred percent. Really, yeah. see, I would think it's the opposite. Stage uh, stage magic, as in like stand up magic, is probably more lucrative than close up. No, wait, it, I guess you know, because it's a number of gigs, maybe. Because you can well, no, it, depends what, it depends on what level you were in. I mean, in my day, I mean, every every room, every pub had a room above, and there was only like you know, eighty people in. You know, so there used to be a place called the Earth Exchange in Archway, and, and it held twenty three people. It was a vegan restaurant, and you got paid a fiver uh, and a meal. And uh, and the first what time kind of I, did it, I did it with Rory Bremner uh, and Norman Lovett. And uh, uh, I don't know, I can't remember who else, but I mean, everybody did it. But the thing was, is that when you did the, you know, I did the comedy store and got, you know, I, the, you know, that's how I, I got to tour with Ronnie Corbett. I was, I, Jonathan Ross saw me there. I was his warm up man for two years. And, you know, you get seen in these places. Yeah. You know, one of the problems, I think, with magic, this does not have to do with comedy, is, is that too many of us don't do gigs where people can buy tickets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, 
There was a time you're, in my you're, career you're, where I was making a, a lot of money and I was as busy as can be. And people say, can I come and see? And I'd say, no. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think a lot of magicians, um, our acts are an interruption, not the reason people are out. Yeah. So that's, well, which yeah. is, you know, that, that's, that's, that's the reality of the world we live in. You know, I have a, a when I'm doing a, a lot of table hopping, I'll say, hi, I'm here because the management don't think you can have fun. They've paid me to make sure you have more fun. <laughs> we don't trust you. I mean, it, it gets a bit of a laugh and it, and it works. Yeah. But, it, but that is basically what my job is. You're here to have a good time. We don't think you can do it on your own. Let me help you. My, yeah. well, I, my opening line was, would you like to see some magic? And say yes, because I'm going to show you anyway. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. Right. That is nice. It's one of those ones, actually. I, I say it's an opening line, but you kind of, you can gauge it. Whenever you go to over the table, I don't really have one single opening line I use. I, I, I'll, I'll watch them as I walk over. And I'll think, where am I going to go with this? Am I going to be kind of this? And if, if I think I can be quite cheeky, that's like, but you guys clearly are not having enough fun. I'm here to help. And uh, <laughs> that, that can go down quite well. Years, Normally when they're having loads of fun, you can do that. Years ago, I saw that tip about uh, color changing knives where you go up and you say, oh, did you drop this red knife? And then they say, no. And you go, oh, how about a white knife, right? Yeah, that's yeah. good. But I remember, that's good. Oh, it's an old, old thing. I it's a very old one, yeah. I remember reading it in a magic book, and the first time I ever tried it, I said, did you drop this red knife? And the guy said, yes, and took it. It's <laughs> <laughs> <is> so good. <laughs> That's great. So, oh, you know, when you said there's, um, obviously, when you, in magic, we have magic for magicians, magic for non-magicians, well, most magic for non-magicians, but in comedy, are, are there certain things where there's jokes only for comedians, or it just depends on the personal situation oh, you're yeah, in, well, I guess? Oh, yeah. Well, there's a whole film about it. Oh, okay. Which, which, which the, Ar the Aristocrats? Yeah. I mean, the Aristocrats. Great film. Yeah. I mean, I could have watched that. Yeah. Oh, you, you, yeah. You, you watch it, and you need a shower afterwards. It's Pendulette, oh, dude. Pendulette. Oh, Pendulette. Yeah. Pen, oh, wow. No, Pen, Pen, Pen filmed it, produced it. Oh, and really? I, oh, yeah. okay. But, but tell you what, though, I find the whole film a bit long, and I find that joke a bit much. <laughs> on the DVD, mm -hmm. there's a section. There's a section of comedians telling comedians jokes and, yeah. and and they're they're great actually they really are good no i i mean the really the great joy of being a comedian in in the heyday of british alternative comedy was was the dressing room oh. right you know i mean you sometimes see these these dramas on television where comedians are all almost suicidal and it's always very backbiting and we all hate each other mm -hmm. we didn't we all really liked each other uh okay. we all realized that we really weren't competing against each other we were competing against ourselves because uh That's and nice. and except for that bastard alexi sale <laughs> well <there's> that <laughs> I just want to just shout that out or something. I just picked a random name there. I have no idea what the guy's like. I just picked a yeah. random name. <laughs> the, uh, the, the magicians. Well, I, I did once uh, had, had at the comedy store, had to hold back a very drunken Paul Merton from jumping on stage and punching a very drunk, um, oh, who was it? Frank Skinner. Oh, wow. <laughs> Because they, they thought they stole each other's jokes, but neither of those boys drink anymore, and, and the world's a better place. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to say, of that whole kind of generation of comedians, Frank Skinner is probably one of my favorite. Oh, Frank, was lovely, Frank was a lovely guy. Because he, uh, he just does his own thing. He really does just tell the stories that he wants to tell, and it's not. And he starts talking about anal sex and pornography in a relatively at, you know, politically correct world. He was just telling stories that that you just tell your mates down the pub if they were. And what happened with, and what happened right. with Frank is, is that he was a he was a, a comedian on the circuit, and he had his twenty minutes of material, and then and he was from Birmingham, and then somebody opened up a comedy club in Birmingham and, and made him 
the resident, it was kind of half his club and made him the resident MC. And he realized that, and so he just kind of went on and, you know, he did his act for the first week. And then the next week he said, well, I'm not going to do an act anymore because I'm just here to introduce the next act, but he would chat. And then he realized that his chat was as funny as anything else. And then that's how he got prolific. I mean, that's, mm. that's one of the nice things about being thrown in at the deep end, you know, with, with comedy and magic is that you have to, uh, you know, sometimes, and that's what Mother Night Magic was all about, you know? I mean, mm. I had to do 15 minutes of new material every week. Yeah, you've just you've just made me think about uh, an aspect of comedy. I think that's become more and more uh, prevalent, certainly with uh, uh, people trying to break into comedy because certain great comedians make it look good. So I'm talking about crowd work. So if you look at someone like Al Murray or Dara O'Brien, their crowd work, their back and forth with the crowd is unbelievable, and they make it look so easy, but yes. insanely hard to do. But that is maybe right. something that magicians, because we have to work with the crowd quite regularly, maybe that's something that magicians find mm. not easier, but we have more chance to practice it. Yeah. And get good at it. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I pride myself on my crowd work. And, uh, um, but I work a crowd like a comedian. Like, so yeah. for my cruise ship show, see, I, I also firmly believe that you shouldn't get anybody I'm not sorry not you shouldn't I personally don't bring people on stage unless they know it's a magic show okay if I'm gonna do a show and uh, like a corporate show my, I, my feeling is is these guys aren't getting paid to be on stage so even though I use the audience a lot, I do a book test, I make people in the audience do things, I make them pick cards, I make them pick words. I never bring them on stage. That's uh, interesting. And on a cruise ship, I don't bring anyone on stage in my A show. Now in my B show, they, they know who I am by that point in time and they know they can trust me. And I, I do a little bit of it, but I don't do a lot of it. This, you know, this magician who I mentioned before, who said, you know, whose jokes do you do? He's one of those guys that, you know, drag somebody on stage and makes them wear a wig and an apron. And, you know, it's all that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and, and it's, it's undeniably funny, but yeah. I, I don't, I don't think it's fair. Well, yeah, exactly. That's, see, that's, that's the mm. thing. It's very easy as a magician to get laughter from the fact that you can, you, you you know the secret, the person next to you doesn't. So I, I, because I do work with audiences a lot as well, and I, you see me, I, I tease my audience and I tease, if I have volunteers, I will tease them. But because of that, the magic I choose to do, I can't ever do a sucker trick. The second I do any kind of sucker trick or any trick where I'm outwitting the audience member, the audience turns against me like that. Because, right. because I'm picking on them, verbally but because the magic's kind of fun and maybe I'll, oh i'm messing up the magic i'm allowed to mm. pick on the audience but the second i'm the cool slick person i can't be picking on them in that way because That's a good point, yeah. because it's too much comedy is so important in any magic act that you do whatever you're performing you need someone like me i need a bit of comedy in there just some some sort of jokes to break the ice because i think it's very important so for when, all you Go ahead. When I watched you, I, I've said it low, quite a few times to you, but I watched you do the first time it was at Café de Paris. And it yeah. was too loud for you to talk. Yep. Yeah. It was too loud for you to talk. And you started doing your coin and pen routine. Mm -hmm. And you mimed. But you mimed in such a way that it was funny, but not, not comical. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to do it many times and let me know what you think of that again. You just, you just went, uh, and you just had these moves that was just, yeah. just exaggerated to the right amount. You look okay. like right. Chaplin. It was so, oh, that's nice. not Charlie Chaplin. It was, was great. It was funny to watch, but not. I wasn't laughing at you. Yeah. You suddenly became a whole different person. Okay. But I, I, I don't do that I again. Mean, I mean, I think that if you're doing anything more than five, ten minutes, you're probably going to need to chuck some comedy in there. Yeah, but, yeah I guess so. I'm, but I mean, I'm going to do one. I'm going to do one, uh, but I can't imagine charging for it. <laughs> Yeah. That, that's that's my thing too. You know, I was like, oh, how do I charge for this? I mean, if someone books well, you, that's coffee. different. Co okay, so 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 people at home, yeah, coffee, K O dash F I, 
Um, I'm finding that I'm getting a bit of money, not the kind of money I used to get. It's only three pound a pop, but you, you're not charging. But it's like, thanks very much. And if you want to say thanks, I'm not charging anything, but you can buy me a copy and you get three yeah. pounds through PayPal. And that's, I think yeah. if someone's watching for half an hour, I think a three pound thing. That's actually better but, than your street performing, isn't it? Because again, if you've got, <laughs> no. I, what are I you saying like, I used to get three pound a pop for street performing? No, 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 but that's from one person, right? So if you're performing to like 50 people here online, you can perform to 200 people. No one's going to be in, in a crowd trying to, yeah, you know. Yeah, but, but, but online you can't guilt people who don't give you money. That's the big difference. Exactly. That's the big difference. One of my favorite bottling lines was I used to say to people, uh, and when you put money in my hat, come and shake my hands because I want to meet and greet the people that are supporting my pregnant wife and 13 children. <laughs> I'd, always, um, I'd always finish my act with a child volunteer and my line would be, um, don't forget the money's not for me. It's for my child, and that yeah. you know that would yeah. get. I think anything when you want to do a hat speech or a bottling speech, as you say, right? If you put a put a comedy in there, but then it takes away from the ah, give me money, you know. But it's I always mean, you always need comedy in your hat speech, but, right? But talking about that, there is a thing where people are as you start your. If you're a magician doing this and you do your bottle speech, you will do it before the grand finale. You'll you 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 ask for money and then you mm. do the thing they've been standing yeah. for twenty five yeah. minutes for. Yeah, and what you'll see when you start that speech is people walking away. Right, right. That's right. When it's, and and some street performers go at those people. They will. Mm. I've seen them go like really kind of where are yeah, you going? Wow. What or you know it's okay. You can leave. But all that's day. yeah. You can't. I think that I don't like the fact that I mean, if you're a comedy magician and where you're, you that's your character, that's different. But if you're actually calling someone back, it's just very awkward, isn't it? I mean, I don't know what you think. What do you think about that, John? Maybe I'm wrong there. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good idea. I, I, I never thought about doing my bottle of speech before the thing. I used, to, uh, I used to remember that. I also do remember that there was a, I mean, I had a lot of gags in my bottling speech, but I, I also then did stop it and say, this is what I do. And think about how much you pay for other entertainment and and you know, I mean, I did, I did have a hard sell in there, and, yeah, that, well, and yeah. then, I, but then I always had to take the edge off with the pregnant wife and thirteen children. Yeah, you well, I think it's, it's so, so now it's pretty standard for magicians do their their speech a trick and then say, and here's my hat. Yeah, um, that's that's fairly standard. Yeah, now. you do a speech um, before the thing. But, uh, but but it's when we, but it's when people walk away. Some magicians will go after like really strong people. Go after, others, I, I, I would occasionally go, guys. You know, blah, blah. And look, if you don't want to pay me like those those guys there, it's fine. Just come and say thank you. If you really can't afford it and you have to mm. walk like them, just come and say thank you instead. Mm. That, so I don't go hard, we but I just. Yeah. We should do a, we should do a street uh, a street talk as well because I. Yeah. I, I mean, I've I done one, but we can do. I've done one, but we can always do it again. Um, yeah. You know, we can do something, maybe something specifically well, on bottling in, or like on a hat speech. Thing. In my day. <laughs> in my day. But John, when you were doing street magic, it was must have been Egypt because there weren't any cars going up and down. Did that, that really right. help? But there was the horse crap. All <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and of course, dodging Jack the Ripper couldn't have been easy, you know, back, back in those <laughs> But But in, in, in closing, what advice do you give for someone who wants to add a bit of comedy in their act? Is there any books that they can do or does it have to come from inside? Or... My advice is if you want to do a comedy club, Mm -hmm. Okay, which is different than putting comedy in your act. Okay, but I I recommend doing comedy clubs. Magicians don't do comedy clubs enough. Yeah, yeah. They, they give up too soon. I mean, when in my day there was only three of us doing the circuit. If you want to do comedy club, you start with your funniest joke. Oh. Okay. Don't okay. save it for later, because yeah. it you have to get them. And if you okay. save it later, they won't be there. You have to get them right. fast. Start with your funniest joke and then follow it with your second funniest joke. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. You can start with a trick. Yeah. But it's got to be good and it's got to be quick and it's got to be sharp. And then you got to tell a joke because you're in a comedy club and comedy's yeah. in the room. Yeah. yeah. So that's sure. it. And, and then if you want to do comedy magic or put comedy magic, 
the way I've always felt about a routine is, is I learn a routine and I learn all the finger work. I learn the <laughs> sides or whatever. You know, I learn, you know, the ring, the bowl fills up with water and now it's, now it's got mm. double the water and now it's got rice. Okay. And I learn all that. And then I try to have one joke and hopefully the joke is about two thirds of the way into the trick. So I know I have one joke that I'm pretty sure is going to work. And then I just wing it. And cause I'm, cause I, I'm a funny guy when I just talk and then you do it. And then hopefully you say something funny on the way to that one line. And when you leave, like the jazz musicians say, you remember your riff. Yeah. And so you remember that line. And if it works, then you use that. Now you have two lines. You have a line and you wrote and you have that line. And then you do it again. And then sure enough, you have three. And then it becomes a routine. Mm. So right. my comic isn't written. It evolves. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I think. Like, yeah. Like most fashion. 100%. Guys, also, yeah. I mean, that's how my actual. I'm also going to say, though, I think that if you. John is genuinely a naturally funny guy. I, I think I am as well. People, not everyone is. And not mm -hmm. everyone is comfortable riffing and making stuff up. And if that's the case, first off, I really think there's nothing wrong with having standard lines that everyone uses that you're not just ripping off a magician. Ripping off a mm -hmm. single person's funny line is not right. Using right. the standard lines that we all kind of know, okay, that's fine. So don't be afraid to use those because whilst we as magicians have heard them hundreds of times, your audience almost certainly haven't. So it's all right. If you want to learn how to write jokes, there are some books and guides out there that I find quite good. I really like, I'm a big fan of a guy called Tim Ferguson. Um, and he's wrote something called like the cheeky monkey writing comedy book or something like that. That's more about narrative comedy. But what he does in that is he dissects why things are funny. So he's talking more about the philosophy of magic, uh, of, um, of comedy, which for me is really important. And then uh, Jimmy Carr did The Naked Jake. That's another really good thing. And also The Naked Jake is a really good thing because there's loads of just little very simple gags in there that you can learn and just use that are quite funny. So I, I think that if you don't want, if you want to use comedy in your magic, you're not looking at becoming a comedy magician, but you want to use your comedy in your magic, that's, but that's you know, a good point to take. But the other thing too is, is, you know, just if you're going to do comedy, just have an intention to do comedy. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, you know, Ali Cook is a stand up comedian. And and Ali, Ali isn't a uh, an off the cup. Don't get me wrong; he's one of the most talented people I know. Mm. But one of the reasons he's one of the talented people I know is because he works at it. And when he does comedy, he treats it like it's learning an Ascanio spread. I mean, he really sits down and digs into it, and then puts the effort into it. And then well, you, yeah. spoke, you spoke about Monkhouse earlier as well. Exactly the same. He had. How many books of common of just jokes did he have when he passed? You know. Yeah. Mm. Listen, I gotta go, but I'll finish with my yeah. Bob Bob story. I did uh, Celebrity Squares twice. Okay, so the first time I did Celebrity Square, the only reason I was on it is because I knew the producer. He had produced a little TV show I did down in TVS, and so he kind of snuck me on, and so. Uh, I was just a job and comedian. I'd done a couple little TV shows, but nothing big. And uh, so I go into Central TV and I'm walking down the hallway and Bob Bunkhouse is walking towards me. And uh, by the way, I used to have a huge mustache and big glasses. And um, and I'm walking down the hallway and I see Bob Monkhouse and it's like, oh, wow, it's Bob Monkhouse. So I stop him. There's nobody around. And I say, Mr. Monkhouse, I just want to say hello. My name is John Lanahan. I'm going to be one of the celebrities in the thing tonight. And he looked at me and he went, what happened to your mustache? Because I just shaved it off like a couple weeks before. And I said, oh, I got tired of it. And he said, and I used to have a great opening line. I used to have this opening line where I'd walk on stage and I'd say, I went to the joke shop today and I was going to buy a pair of those funny glasses with the nose and mustache attached, but I thought, why bother? And it was a really good opening line because uh, it was just it was a really good opening line. And Bob Monkhouse said, but what about that opening line? And I, 
And I said, yeah, well, I kind of miss that opening line. Anyway, uh, I do the show. And after the show, I'm in the bar with Bob and I'm talking to him. But I'm, I had to go to America the next day. So I had a car came and we interrupted our conversation. A year later, I'm going to do Celebrity Squares again. And this time I'm center square because I had my TV show. And I had this idea where Bob had a card selected and everybody in the Celebrity Squares thing holds up a board and it becomes a giant three of hearts. Okay. And I said, but I need Bob to have a card, uh, give him a fake deck so he can force yeah. a, a card. Yeah. And, and I said, so I need like, 15, 20 minutes with Bob to teach him how to do this. Yeah. So I show up and it, I get sent into the dressing room. He's in the dressing room. I explained the trick to him. And I said, I got this fake deck of cards here. And he turned to me and he said, well, I'd use a rough and smooth Svengali for that. <laughs> he had a complete working knowledge of magic. Wow. Uh, so then he did the trick. But here's the best thing. Mm -hmm. At the end of the night, I went into the bar and Bob picked up the conversation from the year before. Wow. I, yeah, he was a remarkable guy. Wow. Yeah. What is Paul doing? Paul, are you outside or something? You're at your place in Collardale, right? Yeah, he's, Paul's gone. Okay. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, since you've got to go to, well, let's end the video here. Um, so that's great. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you for, where is Paul? Paul has disappeared. But uh, yeah, thanks, John, for taking the time to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the people watching at home. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did, talking to John and Paul, who I think has disappeared. But uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video in a couple hey, of days. Yeah. Do me a favor. If you're in the yeah. Facebook group, um, Just Magician. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or on the Magic Circle members. Yeah, yeah. I've posted, I've posted two videos. Uh, okay on how to do tricks in there. Oh. And I'm really proud of them. So have a look. Okay, I'll go and check it out. I'll go and check it out. Yeah, uh, same for the people watching this. Go and check it out. Uh, well, if it's don't you look at it. It's, it's way, you don't need it. You don't need so, any magic. Sorry, my, my food oh. order arrived. Just as John's. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> no problem. Okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna end the video here. Well, I'll see you in two days. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, John. Um, take care. Pleasure. Yeah. So uh, take okay. care, guys. Have a good one. Wash your hands. Right. Yeah. <laughs>